Today, I'm going to tell you about the biggest story in MMA since the ESPN deal that no one is covering with the correct context. Ariel has put out a rundown of the events, but he is missing the bigger picture in my eyes. I'm going to show you how. On August 1st, 2022, head coach of Glory MMA, James Krause, went on the MMA Hour to discuss his star pupil, Brandon Moreno's recent interim title victory over Kai Kara France. Unbeknownst to him, he was about to ignite a controversy that has put his entire career into dire jeopardy. If I take time and train three, four times a day, it's going to take away from other things that I have going on, businesses, you know, betting, handicapping fights, whatever. And it just, it financially doesn't, even, to be honest, financially doesn't make any sense for me. Mm. But Now, Ariel realized right away the importance of what he just said and asks a follow-up. I see that you're very interested in the uh, the betting side of things. Like, how often do you partake yeah. in this? Oh, I bet every single card, just about every fight. Really? Yeah, absolutely. We have a I have a Discord, like two thousand members in it. In there, Kraus further discloses that he runs a Discord server for people like my dad who don't know what that is. Essentially, it's like an online chat room. Kraus uses it to discuss picks and plays, which is referred to as a tout service. That means someone who sells gambling picks to bettors. But the next part of the interview was when I realized that Kraus was going to get into some real trouble. We crushed it. Last week, we destroyed it. Uh, like, I'm, I take over people's accounts and play for them. Like, I, I post the losses you know, myself on some accounts. Like, I don't... This is a serious ethical violation. Gambling accounts are tied to social security numbers for this very reason. Gambling sites have to confirm that you are the person you say you are. By admitting to taking over someone's account, Kraus opens himself up to major, rational questions about the possibility that he could be hiding his gambling by using dummy accounts. This further opens the door to the possibility that he could hide fixing fights, which is what most people focused on in the aftermath of the interview. But Kraus then says something important for later. I, I do pretty well. I make more money gambling on MMA than I do anything else. Come on, more than even coaching? Oh, God, that don't make shit on coaching. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's absolutely not. Continuing with the interview, Kraus again admits to a further ethics violation here. And just curious, like the Moreno fight, like fights that you're involved in, will you bet on those two? Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's... Sometimes, a... <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you bet on Brandon? Of course. He was a big favorite, though. Two to one. No, that's two not to, a big favorite. Oh, he was. Okay. It's, well, what did he close two at? One, it, two of five. Notice that he has the ending gambling line of Marino's fight memorized. And what was Ariel's follow-up question to this stunning admission? Overall, how'd you do Saturday? Kraus then explains the structure of how he makes money through the Discord. Dude, and when you say we, what do you mean by we? The Discord? The Discord. The group. The, yep, the group we're in. I, just, I, put, I post the plays and, and people, you know. And play do people pay you for this? For the picks? Yep. Wow. And that's yep. lucrative. Yep. Look that's at you. Um, that, but it does, but that, I mean, they make way more, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. More, like we have a couple different, we have a couple different uh, entry level positions. Like we have a $50 a month and I have a $2,000 a month, but they, I mean, they make way more than, you know, they make way more than they pay. That's for sure. But Ariel surely pushes back now, considering the simple connection that betters are paying Kraus for inside information, right? And uh, just if someone wanted to join this, how could they like how can they sign up for this? How does that work? No, he records a sales pitch for Krause's unethical gambling ring. He seems to be blinded by his own distaste for the UFC's pay structure with regard to fighters and coaches, leading him to have a bit of tunnel vision to these ethics violations. So I listened to this live and immediately realized the problems it was going to cause for James Krause, but didn't think much of it. The UFC tends to handle punishments off the record and in-house, so I expected a slap on the wrist behind closed doors. But the following events shocked me. On October 15th of 2022, Kraus and his fighter, Mana Martinez, had just finished the second round of his fight when the ESPN production team went to Kraus for his coaching corner. Here, take it. We're good. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You're doing f***ing around too much. This is your fight to win. Yes, sir. You've heard him like three times now and you're f***ing around. Let's we'll go. We'll take a quick 30-second break and be back with round three. As a devoted member of MMA Twitter, I saw immediately a massive amount of jokes and insinuations that James had placed a bet on this fight and that he was coaching his fighter to win him the bet. I want to say officially that I do not know if he had a bet on the fight and I doubt that a hypothetical bet was on his mind at all, but the insinuation was still there. Two days later, 
the UFC sends out a memo to all fighters updating their conduct policy to ban fighters, coaches, and family members from gambling on fights that they are a part of. I think it would be incredibly coincidental if this wasn't linked to the public perception generated by Krause's admission on the MMA hour combined with the coaching in that fight. But things largely went quiet from there, and I sort of put it in the recesses of my brain. I only realized how massive a problem this could become on October 22nd at UFC 280. For those that don't know, TJ Dillashaw lost by TKO to Aljamain Sterling after repeatedly dislocating his left shoulder. In his post-fight speech, he admitted to the following. Um, I gotta apologize to the weight class, kind of held it up. I, I completely blew my shoulder out at the end of April as soon as I started getting ready for this and uh, I probably dislocated a good 20 times throughout training camp. This is uh, by far the toughest training camp I've been through because of that, emotionally, you know? That's why I was talking some about his weak stand-up because I didn't want him to wrestle, man. I knew that was the case. I told the ref in the back before he came out that most likely my shoulder is going to pop out. If it does, I'll get it back in. Please do not stop it. Um, unfortunately, that second like round, you know, I couldn't, couldn't push up off my shoulder. So hats off to Aljamain for doing what he does. And uh, great win, you know? It was this admission that set the gears in motion for this video. Because this created a massive question in my mind. Why didn't the UFC disclose it? Why did the fight happen? Why didn't the medical staff call it off? Who was responsible for allowing TJ, with essentially no left shoulder, to compete in a sanctioned cage fighting match? And most importantly to the UFC's financial side, how did this affect the gambling market on this fight? Five days later, I had my answer. TJ did an interview with Brett Okamoto, which opened my eyes further to the problem I now outline. And I guess, I guess that's how we'll start it, man. Like this whole thing starts in April, would you say? Like, like <clears throat> where did the story begin, I guess. Yeah, man. So um, I'd say six or seven months after my knee surgery, you know, the beginning of the year, I'll say like January, February, somewhere in the beginning of the year, um, I started doing some uh, weight, heavy weight training in my upper body, still trying to recover from my knee surgery. And I noticed that my left shoulder was a lot, my left arm, my left side was just a lot weaker than my right. Um, I didn't feel like I had any kind of injury going on. So I was thinking maybe I had some sort of nerve issue going on. So I went and saw a neurologist. Um, she did an MRI on my neck and my shoulder. And uh, she's like, it's not, not anything to do with your nerves. Uh, you know, unfortunately you have a torn uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus in your left shoulder, but I've been dealing with shoulder problems for a long time. Right. So, um, it was, it, it was torn, but it's been torn. It's been torn for a long time. We'll get into that later too. Um, but that's what the issue was, right? No big deal. I don't know if you caught it, so I'm going to play that again. But I've been dealing with shoulder problems for a long time, right? So um, it was it, it was torn, but it's been torn. It's been torn for a long time. We'll get into that later too. Um, but that's what the issue was, right? No big deal. So I kept listening. And we'll get to this later on of, of everything else, but I've fought like this before. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I knocked out Cody Garbrandt twice with two blown out shoulders. You know, my shoulders were both dislocating for that Garbrandt fight. I probably, so before that first Garbrandt fight, I tore my left shoulder on the ultimate fighter doing the coach's challenge. We were playing tetherball on that balance beam and I fell off and tried to catch myself and, and hurt my shoulder. In that fight camp, I dislocated my shoulder probably a good, 10 to 15 times it was a sublux right where it'd pop out and go back in on its own um and it hurt and it affected my grappling but what was i going to do not take the fight you know what i mean i was i wanted to get my title back kind of yeah. same situation i mean now we'll get to that and then the second fight it was my right shoulder same kind of thing hitting a bag and i hurt my right shoulder and then that one started subluxing right and so so this isn't the first time he fought this injured this explains why he didn't disclose why would he he's done this before also, don't miss the fact that he tore his shoulder during the Ultimate Fighter and continued to train on it anyway. Has he ever had it fixed, though? Then, after I lost to Hudo, I got double shoulder surgery. I didn't just get double shoulder surgery because I wanted to. I got it because I needed to. But something I'd been putting off because I had big title fight after big title fight. Look this shocked me. I can't imagine the mindset it would take to get into a cage with Cody Garbrandt and Henry Cejudo with blown shoulders. I'm going to repeatedly come back to this interview, so keep it in the back of your head. Like Helwani before him, Brett continued to miss the forest for the trees in his follow-ups. He asked questions mainly through the perception of fighting, not with a mind on TJ as an individual person. 
So we are now going to skip nine days forward to the fight that truly ignited the powder keg of issues. Derek Minner takes on Shailon Nurdenbeki. Near the midpoint of the first round, Derek Minner seemingly blew his knee on a kick before throwing another kick that clearly showed his knee was compromised. Not an uncommon occurrence in MMA. It's a truly brutal sport. What was controversial was the evidence coming out immediately after the fight ended, showing that in the hour prior to the opening bell, a number of individuals had put down serious amounts of money on Minner to lose, and it is implied that a sizable portion of that money was on him to lose by TKO in the first round. And of course, who is Minner's coach? James Kraus. Fight-fixing allegations abounded, but the UFC remained typically silent on the matter. Reporting came out saying that the bets placed in that hour were so suspicious that many sports books shut down the fight line out of fear of a fix. The UFC's gambling integrity partner immediately flagged the fight as suspicious, but again, silence enveloped the sport. The UFC seemed to imply that Kraus was not under investigation but wouldn't say anything else. In fact, Dana said this. Yeah, I mean, th this is one of those things. There's absolutely zero proof that anybody that was involved bet on it. So it's just, there, there was some, uh, you know, um, there was some signs out there that, that something was going, but there's absolutely no proof that anybody did anything wrong. Um, and hopefully by seeing this again in this investigation, it, it deters people from, from doing it, from betting on it. The, the, the bottom line is this, you're never gonna be able to bet enough money to win. To, it's not worth the risk. To bet on one of these fights first of all nobody even took the action on the fights you know they just saw that that type of action was trying to come in and 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 it, and it got shut down but hopefully you see how easy that is to detect now and the risk is not worth the reward but that was until november 19th of 2022 miles johns fought vince morales to a decision victory and in his post-fight speech said the following my coach last night at the dinner table got pulled and they said the UFC was suspended him, so he couldn't be here in my corner. So I got my pops, I got my two brothers with me right now. And who is that coach you ask? James Kraus. Again. Five days later, James Kraus shut down the betting discord service called the 1% Club. Now I want to pause here. Something happened in the editing of this video. That audio I played for you of John's talking about Kraus came from a recording I took of the post-fight interview direct from the ESPN Plus replay of the fight. To save myself some time in the editing of this video, I downloaded a Chrome browser extension to more easily pull clips for this video. I then downloaded the one from the UFC's YouTube posting of the post-fight interview, and while cutting it up, realized that the audio clip was not in the official posting on YouTube. What I mean is that the UFC edited out John saying Kraus was suspended, from their official posting of his post-fight speech. You can only find that audio I used if you scrub to the end of the fight replay on ESPN Plus and manually pull it. Don't take my word for it. I'm gonna show you my pulling right now. My family across the state, almost across the United States. My coach last night at the dinner table got pulled and they said the UFC was suspended so he couldn't be here in my corner. So I got my pops. And now the UFCs. I took this fight on two weeks notice. I just changed gym, moved my family across the state, almost across the United States. So I got my pops, I got my two brothers with me right now. I make no statement for what this means. I leave it in your very capable, logical hands. And the final point of our timeline. On December 1st, 2022, AGCO, or the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario, suspended gambling on UFC events. The next day, AGLC, which is comparable to the AGCO, but for Alberta, Canada, made the same move. And the final event I will cover in terms of active news, the same day of the AGLC statement, James Krause was banned from coaching in the UFC, and any member of his gym was banned from competing in the UFC as well. This is the end point of the history that I will cite in this video. Anything that occurred after December 2nd, 2022 will be considered the future based on the writing of this essay. In this admittedly incredibly long essay, I'm going to tell you why you should care and what I think may happen. I want to thank at FinesseMMA135 on Instagram who sent me a question that started all my research on this topic. Up front, I don't think that the UFC has a consistent problem with fight fixing at all. Why do I feel confident? Because TJ admits to telling no one about his injury, even family members that bet on him. I fully believed that I was going to go in there and get this victory.
There's never once in my life I didn't think that I was going to get, go in there and get this victory against Aljamain Sterling. My coaches believed it. My training partners believed it. I had, you know, friends and family that placed bets on me, like big, big, big bets on me that I was going to go in there and get it. Obviously, I'm not telling them or anything what's going on, right? Especially because I believe I'm going to go in there and get the win. Remember that his fight was five days after the memo saying people related to fighters can't gamble on their fights. Did Brett press him on this? No. Did the UFC punish him for this? Not that I have seen. So here's the thing. Again, I doubt fights are fixed with any regularity. But I do think that the UFC has a problem with the perception of fight fixing that will only continue to grow and cause greater and greater problems for the UFC financially. I believe the UFC is only now realizing the totality of the problem and is overreacting without thinking much about the consequences nor the precedents they are setting. But the dominoes have already started to fall, and I think this is only going to get much, much worse. And here's why. At a fundamental level, we need to discuss the basics of how UFC fighters get paid. UFC contracts function on a fight-based show-and-win purse model. Essentially, a fighter signs a deal for a set amount of fights with 50% of payment offered to show, meaning stepping into the cage and the door locking, and the remaining 50% offered if the fighter wins their fight. Other payouts are offered for fight of the night and performance of the night. In the past, there were additional bonuses offered for knockout or submission of the night as well. But why did Dana build the UFC this way? Back in 2013, Dana gave a lecture at Stanford to explain his reasoning simply. The thing that we do different than any other sport, especially boxing, when you think about boxing, right? They do the same thing. And how many guys in here, who's boxing fans? I am, I'll raise my hand too, okay? Like five of you and me. Uh, but here's the thing that boxing did, and, and, and the question was asked earlier on, on the decline of boxing. <clears throat> well, what would happen was the fight would be coming. It's a week away, and I'm so excited, I can't wait. I'm watching everything. I'm reading everything that leads up to the fight, right? It's the night of the fight. I got all my buddies over. We bought all the pizza and the beer, and we're ready to roll, and a fight never happens. These guys run around for 12 rounds, and the fight doesn't happen. Do you know why? Do you know why this has happened and why boxing is dying? Because the sport has become so greedy. Nobody was ever thinking about the future of the sport. It's about how much money can we all put in our pocket right here, right now? Who cares about tomorrow? So essentially what you get at the end is you get two multi-millionaires, right, who step into the ring and do everything they can to avoid a fight so they can win, just barely win, to get to the next multi-million dollar fight that we pay for, right? And it, it, it just became ridiculous, and, it, and it's, it's exactly what goes. Think about this. Think about every person in this room right now if I guaranteed you all $37 million. Guaranteed. I guarantee you $37 million this year. Guess what you're going to do? Not much. Not much. Are you going to bust your every day? Your, your alarm's going to go off in the morning, you're going to like, I'm not going to go to class. What to class for? I got $37 million. <laughs> right? Who's going to class if they got $37 million? Nobody's going to class. You know what happens when you get $37 million in your fighter? I don't want to get punched in the face. I got $37 million, man. I'm not getting punched in the face. This is ridiculous. We incentivize guys to fight. You get, a, you, get a, you get money to show, and you get money to win. And then you get money for the best fight of the night, you get money for the best knockout, money for the best submission. You're incentivized. No different than any other business in the world. Show up at your job and have a half-ass day. See how that goes. Now what Dana says is technically correct. I wouldn't go to class if I had $37 million either. But he seems to have a rudimentary understanding of incentives. Thankfully, I did go to my classes, and I now have a degree in neuroscience, so I am perfectly suited to help him. But most importantly, the problem comes in the way he describes how other businesses use incentives. He is not accurately characterizing his business in comparison to others. I think to understand my point, we need to use a comparative model. Let's talk about the NBA, or the National Basketball Association. The NBA is structured financially substantially different from the UFC. Players are given contracts with no stipulations that they have to win, and they have to be paid out in full if injured on or off the court in relation to their training as professional athletes. 
If LeBron James tears his ACL in practice, his surgery is fully covered by the Lakers, the team he plays for, and he gets paid his contract in full. TJ Dillashaw, on the other hand, would not have had this surgery covered unless he competed in this fight with Aljamain Sterling. Even then, he can elect to not have it, as he stated he did. The UFC contract stipulates that they cover injuries that occur in the process of fights, but they do not have to cover training injuries. In the UFC, if you have to pull out of a fight injured, you get nothing. You don't have to get paid your contract value, and the UFC does not have to cover your surgery. By Dana's logic, why doesn't LeBron intentionally try to injure himself in practice every day in order to make money for free? Because LeBron isn't motivated by purely cashing the current check. He is thinking of his next contract. Sure, LeBron could sign a massive deal and intentionally injure himself getting paid out in full the contract, but no one is offering him another contract after. Why? Basic market forces. So Dana's theory has a massive LeBron-sized hole in it. But where Dana is correct is that LeBron's sport does not require him to step into a cage and fight to either unconsciousness or brutal attritional damage. So he does in fact need to be incentivized differently, not just to step into the cage, but to actively compete. If every fighter entered the cage and then ran from each other, no one would watch, just as Dana said. It is in Dana's interest to incentivize combat, and specifically combat that draws the eyeballs of viewers. So, Dana's right, but his reasoning has another major flaw in it. Why not constantly increase fighter pay to increase the incentive to fight? Let's logically break down the two halves of the UFC contract. Paying a fighter to show up is meant to give the fighter an incentive to compete in a fight, even if the skill differences are imbalanced. Think of it like a fighter's minimum wage. It pays for training costs and living expenses. Remember all the way back to Megan Anderson versus Amanda Nunes. Amanda was a massive favorite to win that fight. Also, note who is Megan Anderson's coach. By Dana's logic, Megan needs a bag of cash to even show up for that beating. So that makes logical sense, right? But Dana is also correct on another point. It's not just showing up. It's about committing to violence. He needs that to actually sell a product. So the win bonus functions as an incentive to actively compete at the expense of your opponent. By setting the two fighters win bonus incentives in opposition, Dana has created a clear conflict that leads to exciting fights where both opponents are fighting to starve the other of that win bonus. I think this makes completely logical sense. But this is psychology 101 level understanding of incentives. And hey, I have a degree in psychology and neuroscience. I think I am the perfect person to critique his logic. So with our incentive structure fully outlined, we need to have a cognitive psychology discussion on how to maximally incentivize violence that the UFC wants. Currently, Dana and the UFC seem set on tying show and win bonuses at a one-to-one -one ratio. I think that's incredibly ineffective by Dana's own logic. The UFC is artificially kneecapping itself, as we will come to see. To explain simply, the UFC is putting unneeded pressure on itself to keep win bonuses low in order to not correspondingly raise the show bonus. Based on Dana Stanford's speech, we can assume he is against show bonuses on principle. But he does recognize that it is necessary in the business of fighting. The biggest issue in my eyes is the insistence on artificially limiting his greatest violence incentive leverage. Dana's hyper-focus on what we could term the laziness incentive, which is just money pay that is not in service of completion of work, is easily his Achilles heel in this argument. Decoupling show and win bonuses would allow them to set a sort of artificial maximum show bonus. That again should function sort of like a minimum wage. They can then adjust the levers of win bonuses to incentivize fighters to compete in certain ways. He can raise the win bonus ever higher to get fighters to go to further and further lengths of competition. It's pretty morbid when you think about it that way, but hey, this is the fight business, that's the way it is. But Dana has never adjusted that ratio as a common form of practice based on all available reporting. Why? I genuinely have no idea. Please answer me, Dana. I am trying my best to not straw man you here. So look, here's a free piece of advice from me. Sign contracts with set show bonuses and negotiate win bonuses on an individual fight basis. In economic terms, the natural course of market pressure, assuming the UFC operates a market economy, would progress as follows. First, as revenue grows, fighters' contracts should naturally increase, ideally at the rate of increased revenue generation by the UFC. But they haven't. 
Secondly, if the reasoning for the contract structure is incentive, the UFC should not only be offering larger and larger purses to fighters, but also building in stipulations that rebuild that one-to-one show-to-win ratio more towards larger payouts for winning, further and further incentivizing victory as the primary means of payment. If we don our bourgeoisie hats, we want to have the lowest show bonus that is livable for these fighters while changing win bonuses for fights like the Anderson vs. Nunes example to incentivize Anderson to be aggressive and not try to limit damage while cashing her show check. It would make fights more competitive as the more money offered for winning further and further incentivizes risk-taking and suspenseful competition. But this also hasn't happened. Instead, the UFC continues to expand fighter payments through uniform deals, crypto bonuses, and backroom payouts. Smarter people than I have talked about the effects the Adidas deal had on fighter pay, but essentially the UFC signed a deal with Adidas to control all aspects of fighter uniforms in cage, precluding what was the main area of revenue generation by these prize fighters, which was sponsorships. The Adidas deal removed sponsorships on a fighter basis and replaced it with a tiered payout structure. Oddly, for again just showing up to the cage, which again defies Dana's incentive structure thesis. Fighters get paid out in a tiered structure based purely on raw appearances in cage. Guys like Cowboy Cerrone make the most money, whereas a fighter like Hamzat Shemaev, who is incredibly more popular currently than Cowboy, would get paid a fraction of that tiered uniform revenue. All this to say, if the UFC operates as a market force dominated business like the NBA, where are the market forces? To understand their absence, let's return to the NBA again. The best way to understand why the NBA operates as a market forces oriented business, whereas the UFC does not, comes in the on-screen visuals I have created. Both organizations operate in a tiered structure between the ownership and labor classes. The NBA organization functions as a regulatory body and an overarching business strategic decision maker. Below the NBA are the individual teams, each owned by a private individual of incredible wealth. The owners together vote on who runs the NBA as the commissioner, creating a check and balance on the power of the NBA compared to the individual teams. Below the teams are the agents, who each represent in most cases a multitude of clients, in this case basketball players. And in parallel to the agents is the NBA PA, or NBA Players Association. The NBA PA is a union of players who vote from amongst themselves which player functions as the head of the union. Again, checks and balances on the market. And finally, there are the players. Now as an operation, let's again talk about a specific player to contextualize a typical negotiation process. I'm going to choose Brooklyn Nets guard Ben Simmons. Ben is represented by his manager Rich Paul of Clutch Sports. When Ben was on the final year of his contract, he had a decision to make. Extend his contract with the team that drafted him, the Philadelphia 76ers, or test his value on the open market. Ben could still re-sign with the Sixers on the open market, but didn't have to after his contract expired. Ben chose to extend his contract for the maximum amount the team could offer. Back in 2016, the NBA and the NBA PA agreed upon a collective bargaining agreement establishing that the max NBA contract equated to a set percentage of the team's overall salary cap. Salary cap is a term for the maximum amount of money a team can pay its players. Salary caps were developed to keep the richest teams operating in the largest markets, like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, from dominating the talent on the open market by being able to offer more money than small market teams like the Oklahoma City Thunder. Bigger market teams have larger fan bases, leading to higher revenue concurrently. Okay, but what if Ben Simmons really, really wanted to win a lot of championships fast? Why not sign for the minimum contract with a team like the Golden State Warriors, who are perennially one of the best teams in the NBA? The NBA PA would never allow him to do that. Why? Because if he did, it would set a precedent that players should take less money to increase chances of the team winning. This would tip the balance away from a near 50-50 split in power and revenue between players and teams. So the NBA PA functions to negotiate both the max allowable contract while also maintaining the status quo of contracts by not allowing them to regress through competitive tampering. Agents make a percentage of the money that players get on their contract while receiving none of the prestige that winning games affords. As such, why would they let Ben Simmons take a $500,000 contract rather than the $35.5 million contract he has with the Nets? They wouldn't. To quote the great Thanos, Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Now the NBA has tons of issues right now that I have glossed over, but 
but I think it presents a really great example of a theoretically balanced sports marketplace. Now, let's talk about the UFC. The UFC does not function technically as the overall governing body comparable to the NBA. That is up to the individual state athletic commissions. The UFC is theoretically below them, but the UFC exerts pressure on rules that puts the balance of power somewhere leaning in the UFC's favor. But the UFC also assumes the team-based responsibilities of promoting the individual fights and fighters. The NBA advertises the sport, the NBA teams advertise their players, and the team as a whole. The UFC has to do both because it's a fight promotion and essentially a sports league. Just like the NBA, fighters are represented by managers. But here's where the major divergences occur. In my discussion with fighters, coaches, and managers, I realized that we have to separate out the UFC's labor side into three parts, fighter, coach, and manager, rather than the two-part structure of the NBA with players and managers. Fighters have a deal with their coach, but more broadly their fight camp, and also a separate deal with their manager. Typically, that breaks down into the fighter paying 10% of their purse to their camps and 10% to their managers. Krauss mentions this specifically in his interview with Ariel. I, I do pretty well. I make more money gambling on MMA than I do anything else. Come on. More than even coaching? Oh, God. That don't make sense. Coaching. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's absolutely not. One key thing that I heard repeatedly, the specific method you are acquired to fight in the UFC alters your contract structure. I heard multiple fighters say that if you are signed to the UFC based purely on a deal made by either your coach or manager, that individual's share of your purse increases to 20% and you are locked into a binding deal with them for a set amount of fights, or sometimes it's based on your contract pay structure. What that means is if you surpass a minimum, like say $20,000 to show and an equal amount to win, you revert to that 10% deal. For reference, the NBA proactively caps the percent an agent can take from their client to 4% maximum. So unless the manager negotiates a non-competitive deal with a fighter, every fighter is losing 250% more money than the best deal signed by an NBA agent. If you get locked into that 20%, we are talking 500% less. That doesn't have to be a bad thing though. But my earlier question remains, why hasn't management structure altered as revenue has grown? If managers are making that much more money, shouldn't they be the ones pushing harder for fighter pay increases? Dana's logic would stipulate that they should be even more incentivized than the fighters to make fights, because they get paid to have their fighters get punched in the face. They don't have to take any punishment themselves. Market forces should be pushing the UFC in two directions. Firstly, managers and camps should be constantly competing for top talent by offering to reduce their percentage of purse to incentivize top fighters to train or sign with them. But they haven't, based on all evidence I can find. Conversely, up-and-coming managers should be doing the same, yet all evidence again says that's not happening. Why not? Because we are viewing the UFC through the wrong valence. They don't operate in a market economy like my questions and expected answers would require. To understand the UFC, we needed to take a detour into history. Back to the late Middle Ages and to the country that birthed Cyril Gan's fighting career, France. Back in the European High Middle Ages, economies were not organized in a way recognizable to modern standards. The world was organized into a tiered class structure referred to broadly as feudalism. Peasantry, or serfs, were the average citizen. They were born, worked, and died generally in the same plot of land throughout their entire lives. Feudal lords like kings, dukes, and counts had a genetic ownership of land codified into the structure of feudalism. The most powerful lords owned highly fertile lands where serfs were allowed space to subsistence farm while agreeing to the following. First, their lords could call them to war. Second, they agreed to regular taxation of all excess production of their labor. And third, they submitted to the legal decision of their feudal lord. Laws were at the whim of the lord of the land and private ownership of anything was essentially non-existent. Feudalism didn't have the strict structure that modern governmental bodies have. Everything was based upon relationships. Don't like your feudal lord? Then don't do what he says. That might get you killed. Or if enough people are mad, there's a civil war and you get to be the new lord. But only if you win. Otherwise you die. However, over time, cities began to develop, and their jurisdiction with respect to feudal lords was under constant tension 
beginning in what we now call the late Middle Ages. Cities became areas where the first market economies began to develop. Instead of giving all excess production to their lords, peasants could hide some and sell it on the open market for other needs. What if you were a serf assigned to a wheat farm in central France, but needed to buy a horse to transport your goods? You'll need to trade some wheat for a horse, right? And cue city development. Trade made cities become larger and larger areas of commerce and economic activity. As trade expanded, markets expanded. Cities like Florence, Venice, and the Hanseatic city-states of northern Germany flourished. But a problem emerged. Serfs aren't educated. Why would they be? Underhanded merchants could sell a horse to a peasant for, say, four bales of hay, when the going market value was only two bales. Serf wouldn't know that. Why would they? Greed. If you just sold a horse for two bales and your neighbor sold it for four, you were pissed. But not for the poor serf who paid twice as much. For you, of course. You missed out on two bales of hay. So you and your other horse-selling compatriots organize yourself into a group. Let's call you the Horse Trading Guild of Central France. Your guild determines the going rate for horse trading, and you say it's going to be set at three bales because that's the arbitrary number you chose. Well, that neighbor doesn't like that you are telling him he can't sell for four bales anymore, so he keeps doing it. What can you do? You petition your lord to either arrest, physically harass, or kill the greedy horse trader. Now, you have the force of violence on your side, not just your organizing capacity. The Lord won't just accept that, though. He wants one bale of hay per transaction, or he'll find someone else to lead the guild of horse trading at his price. So now, we have the early basis of a market economy, the first governmental interference in a market, and a super early precursor of what we now call capitalism. We are of course missing a lot from the equation, like the availability of currency increasing due to the discovery of gold in the New World, Protestantism entrenching itself and removing the ban on usury, and the systematic exploitation of essentially the rest of the world by a growing internationalized globalized market. But what does all this have to do with the UFC? In my analysis, the UFC functions as a stunted, guild-based market economy like the one I outlined. Replace the serfs with the fighters, the individual state athletic commissions as feudal lords, and the guild leaders with Dana White and the Fertitta brothers. Ah, but we need to pause there, don't we? My prior evidence only has relevance prior to the 2016 acquisition of the UFC by Endeavor and the exit of the Fertitta brothers from the picture. Remember these concepts though, we will come back to them. With all this said, I keep coming back to the point I earlier made that I think the reporting class of MMA is missing the forest for the trees when it comes to fighter pay. The UFC fundamentally is not the same business as it once was pre-2016 and it doesn't resemble typical market economies like the NBA but the reporting class of MMA doesn't seem to realize that. Something has offset the UFC's natural development into a market economy and left it stunted in a guild-based one. I believe the answer comes in the UFC's purchase by Endeavor. To understand why, we need to understand Endeavor. To understand the UFC's massive, structural business changes over the last few years, you need to understand its parent company, Endeavor. Endeavor, or Endeavor Group Holdings Incorporated, is a parent company formed in April of 2009 by the merger of the William Morris Agency and the original Endeavor Talent Agency. William Morris Agency, or WMA, was a 109-year-old company focused on managing and representing Hollywood talent in all its forms. WMA was hit with a massive setback when a couple major key stakeholders left to start a new agency, Creative Arts Agency, or CAA, leading to a steady decline in WMA's business. This led to the impetus for a merger to regain the power and prestige they once had. Endeavor Talent Agency was founded by Ari Emanuel, who you may know as the real-life basis for the character Ari in Entourage. They too focused on representing Hollywood talent of all kinds, specifically representing actors like Mark Wahlberg, whose life was the inspiration for, you guessed it, Entourage, Matt Damon, and Hugh Jackman, among others. So let's next talk about Endeavor's business strategy. As we have seen recently, as of this recording, with Twitter and Elon Musk, any time a purchase or merger occurs, new management wants to enforce a new governing principle, strategy, and culture on the business. In my research, I keep returning to this simple thesis as the driving force of Endeavor's business strategy. They originally were purely a talent agency, with revenue coming from representing the day-to-day -day contract negotiations inherent to the business of Hollywood and sports like the NFL and NBA. Over time, they realized that owning assets related to the talent they managed would allow for safer, 
more diversified revenue streams. In fact, Ari makes specific mention of this fact in interviews. Okay, so uh, a lot of people just say you're a talent agency. Uh, right. When I look through your financials, that's like a legacy view of your company, and yet yeah. we were somehow unable to change the dialogue. Why is that? Well, you know, I think where you start is kind of how people see you. What we've done over the last, actually, March 29th will be 25 years. Well, we've changed the business into an operating business, kind of aware of the dynamics because of the change of distribution going mm -hmm. out in the marketplace and the entertainment business of how we operate. Most of our business at the time when we started, when Silver Lake came in, about 80 percent was in the representation business, which right. the sports or um, people in the entertainment business. Um, about five years ago, we decided the mix would be better at 50 percent of the economics of the company, things we own, like the UFC or mm -hmm. Freeze or things like that, and 50 percent of things we represent. As such, they have essentially rebuilt the guiding principle behind their business. A key factor in this is something Ari Emanuel said on CNBC. When you think about our company, we're on the supply side of all these um, secular trends. Mm -hmm. So in content, I know that Netflix had a little bit of a falter, but... A little bit. More, well, no. <laughs> if you think about it, if, you, if they take out the Russia 700,000, they would have been up. But in this quarter alone, between Peacock, Discovery, Max... Paramount, Disney, you had 20 million plus 20 million subs come into the uh, direct to the consumer business. Okay. And so from our side, which were the supplier across that platform, um, there's no less demand for content. In fact, content demand is even going up. And you have now a Apple and uh, Amazon pushing in very hard into that marketplace. So, so the little falter of, You're talking about subscribers, oh, subscribers. Not, not their stock. Their stock yeah. took a huge hit, yeah. their subscribers. So subscri which yeah. is why the stock right. took the hit. Right. We don't see any um, a less demand for content. In fact, it's even growing now. Now this is key to understanding Endeavor's strategy with regard to the UFC. They see themselves as the supplier of content for large streaming sites, in our case Disney and by extension ESPN. Here's some more audio to reinforce that point. I've always felt that you have a unique view and vision. If somebody wants to do something, you should take a stake in it. Well, here's my opinion about it. You know, we don't have any legacy infrastructure. I don't have to defend a cable channel. Right. We're, I, I think we're the best position company for the, where the entertainment business is going. So that's their strategy. And their tactical approach to that strategy is to use the management side to spot trends that will affect said streamers to cash in early on them. Honestly, this is very, very smart in my opinion. Let's take a quick detour into business theory to understand some technicals, then return to some tangible examples. All right, so let's first talk about a concept called horizontal integration in acquisition theory. Horizontal integration refers to when a business buys portions, generally controlling interest in businesses in their direct field. For our example, the UFC in the past purchased Strike Force and the WEC to absorb their talents into the UFC's roster. This functions as a way to both eliminate a competitor and improve your product. Horizontal integration gets into really fuzzy territory with respect to monopolizing behavior, so the UFC's FTC is a key regulator in the space. But let's switch from horizontal over to vertical integration. Vertical integration is usually considered a less dangerous, from a monopoly perspective, acquisition strategy. Pre-endeavor, UFC did not often pursue this form of acquisition, so we'll have to use another example. So let's say you own a fashion company that we're going to call The Fashion Company. You purchase fabric from a company called The Fabric Company. Simple enough, right? The Fabric Company purchases the raw materials and manufactures fabric from it, then market that item up a set amount, let's say 20% for our example. So if it costs them $1 to make a foot of fabric, they sell it to you for $1.20 and make 20 cents of profit on each foot they sell. You viewer, an enterprising individual, want to lower your production cost for your fashion company. So you purchase the fabric company so you can buy and manufacture felt for the reduced rate of $1 a foot, saving yourself 20 cents on every foot of fabric you use. This is a simple explainer of the two examples and is missing some context, but we need to have a base understanding to really understand Endeavor's influence on the UFC strategy with regard to integration. 
So what Endeavor has done over the years is pursue a modern post-Netflix streaming strategy of vertical integration. As we said before, they are a talent agency. As they began to represent more and more UFC fighters through their managing branch, they realized that the sport's growth would make for an extremely effective asset in their purchasing portfolio. Think of it sort of as the reverse of the fabric company example from before. What if instead of the fashion company buying the fabric company, the fabric company sees that the fashion company is buying more and more fabric, thus indicating that there is a growing market for their product. So the fabric company purchases the fashion company to see a reverse benefit. In our example, the fashion company bought the fabric company to reduce their costs. If you reverse it, the fabric company purchased the fashion company to expand their revenue. This is the key to Endeavor's business strategy. It is a sort of low cost, test the waters vertical integration strategy. Here is Ari talking about it. We're flexible. Right. We look at things on a global basis. Sometimes we just represent it. Sometimes we've represented and then we acquire it like the UFC, like bull riding, like freeze. U.S. regulators like the FTC are much more fearful of horizontal integration due to the lasting impact of the American Gilded Age post-American Civil War. That doesn't mean it is without faults, though. Here is sort of what troubles me in this interview from a business context. But it does occur to me that the idea that you are an agency is just the way it was. It's a very small piece right. of... And you're kind of like a software as a service business for entertainment. Some of it is, have, correct. But you could then accumulate more. Yes. And that would be the smartest way to be able to make a lot more money. And no one has that model. But back to what Ari said. Endeavor wants to profit off of representing talent, but also the top-end revenue of the sport as a whole. Comparably, they also bought controlling interest in the PBR, which is a professional bull riding promotion. So with this in mind, let's add to our mental timeline of events. In July of 2016, Endeavor, at the time WME-IMG, purchased a 50.1% majority stake in the UFC, buying out most of the Fertitta brothers' equity and a sizable portion of Dana White's. Then, in March of 2021, they purchased the rest of the UFC's shares. But why, and also importantly, how did Endeavor purchase the entire UFC? To really understand, we have to talk about gambling. Back in May of 2018, the U.S.'s Bradley Act of 1992 was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States. This made it legal to bet on sports outside of the state of Nevada. Three months later, DraftKings opened its first sports book in the state of New Jersey. Over time, they have expanded to New York, West Virginia, Indiana, Iowa, New Hampshire, and Mississippi. Let's back up quickly to the Bradley Act, aka PASPA, quoting GamblingLawUS.com. On June 26, 1991, the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Patents, Copyrights, and Trademarks held public hearings on the Senate Bill 474. As a result, Congress found that sports gambling is a national problem. The harms it inflicts are felt beyond the borders of those states that sanction it. Moreover, the Senate Judiciary Committee agreed with the testimony of David Stern, Commissioner for the National Basketball Association, that the interstate ramifications of sports betting are a compelling reason for federal legislation. In light of these findings, it appears that Congress exercised its authority under the Commerce Clause to enact the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act. PASPA in 1992. I highlighted it visually, but to double up on the point, one of the main people for PAPSA was none other than the commissioner of the aforementioned NBA, David Stern. Let's back up a little bit more to 2016. On November 18th of that year, DraftKings and FanDuel announced their intention to horizontally merge into a single holding company. This was rejected by the FTC, the previously mentioned commission dedicated to the regulation of, among many things, the avoidance of monopoly development. The FTC found that had the two merged, they would have owned 90% of the U.S.'s daily fantasy market, constituting a monopoly on the service of daily fantasy competition. But here's the thing. Back in 2016, specifically November 16th, two days before the proposed merger was announced, the projected market value of daily fantasy competitions was projected to reach $18 billion in entry fees by 2020. Entry fees were the way that FanDuel and DraftKings derived revenue from daily fantasy competitions. Betters paid a set entry fee to create a lineup of players in various fantasy sports, mainly baseball and football, with tiered payout rewards depending on the percentile you placed in the competition. 
This key difference made daily fantasy into a competition of skill rather than luck, which would have defined it closer to gambling. Why am I going this in-depth on the merger of the two largest DFS companies? Because in my opinion, the merger was not about daily fantasy. In 2012, the state of New Jersey, home to Atlantic City, the largest gambling region outside of Las Vegas, passed a law legalizing gambling in state-licensed locations. The state was immediately sued by the NCAA, which is U.S. college sports, the NBA, NFL, NHL, and the MLB. For my non-American audience, that is all four major U.S. professional sports and the major governing body of college-level amateur sports. To put it simply, every major athletic association in America was against the legalization of gambling in New Jersey. The case was heard in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey, and the law was struck down in favor of those sports organizations. The state appealed the decision, where it was seen by the Third Circuit Court of Appeals in September of 2013. The courts again sided with the sports organizations. However, a key thing to note was that in my research, this concept was repeatedly brought up. Quote, However, the appeals court also ruled that PASPA did not prevent New Jersey from repealing any existing laws it had. Based on that, New Jersey and its governor at the time, Chris Christie, passed a new law that repealed a former state law banning sports gambling. The league sued again, winning at the district court and again at the Third Circuit Appeals Court in August of 2016. The specific wording on this final decision set the stage for the state's final appeal to the Supreme Court submitted in October of 2016. Everything I can see from the time implies that the wording on the decision was such that many were highly confident that the Supreme Court would find in favor of the state and repeal PAPSA. The U.S. Supreme Court accepted the case in June of 2017, and in May of 2018, the court ruled 6-3 that the law was unconstitutional, opening the door for legalization of gambling. So why this long-winded explanation of legality? I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that DraftKings and FanDuel could read the writing on the wall. Sports gambling was going to be legalized, and they had a pre-established market infrastructure to maximally corner the betting market when it finally legalized. But hey, massive amounts of money wasn't enough. They hypothetically wanted all the monies. The merger was sold to the FTC as a way to consolidate the DFS market. Like I said, the DFS market was projected to hit $18 billion in 2020. Sports gambling in 2021 was valued at $74.2 billion US dollars by Vantage Market Research. To put it simply, that is a market 412% greater than the DFS market, and the merged DraftKings and FanDuel could rake in a massive portion of that revenue. But now, we have to transition to why the UFC became so important in all of this. Let's talk about one of the largest sports betting events in America, March Madness. For those that do not know, March Madness is a single elimination 64-team college basketball tournament to crown the best team in college basketball each year. In 2021, wagers placed on the event were estimated at $3 billion. But what about the first year of legal betting, 2020? zero dollars. You see, in early March of 2020, the U.S. was hit with the beginning of the worldwide pandemic called COVID-19. The NCAA canceled March Madness, $3 billion gone. The NBA postponed its season in the weeks leading up to the playoffs, all that gambling revenue, gone. The NHL postponed its season as well, also leading up to the playoffs, more gambling money, gone. The MLB and the NFL were in their off-seasons, no gambling there either. The five major sports leagues weren't driving any American sports gambling revenue. But who was putting on sports events that could push gambling? The good old UFC. It had to be pushing insane numbers to DraftKings and FanDuel when considering it was the only show in town. Under one year later, on March 4th of 2021, DraftKings paid the UFC $350 million to become the official sportsbook partner of the promotion in a five-year deal. A very important key quote in the initial announcement of the deal was the following, quote, One of the things we do see is more robust data generation from UFC events that can be used in gaming, UFC COO Lawrence Epstein told ESPN. Quote, we are optimistic that in a relative short period of time, we're going to have a lot more in-game, real-time data that's going to enhance the gaming experience on UFC. To translate this, the UFC was going to open its internal data services to DraftKings to help it more accurately set gambling lines and increase betting offerings to users. 
I don't want to get further off track from the overall thesis, but this brings up some pretty interesting ethical flag potential in my opinion that could absolutely be a video in and of itself. That DraftKings deal began an explosion of brand deals with the majority coming in the form of crypto and gambling sponsorships. I want to focus on three major ones. March 4th, 2021, DraftKings paid the UFC $350 million to become the official sportsbook partner of the promotion in a five-year deal. Three days later, the UFC signs a deal with Stake.com, a cryptocurrency-based sportsbook, to become its official sportsbook for Asian and South American betting aside from Brazil. July 8th, 2021, $175 million over 10 years from Crypto.com for uniform rights. August 2021, Stake.com increases their deal with the UFC by expanding to cover Brazil as well. One key thing I want to put in here, the Stake.com deals, there are two of them, do not publicly disclose how much they are paying the UFC for said deal. Now, the UFC made the absolutely correct business decision by cashing in on the fame it had accrued in the form of sponsorship deals following the newly formed post-endeavor business strategy of becoming the owner of the labor and magnifying profitability by diversifying IP sales through NFTs, gambling, and new uniforms. Don't just take my word for it. Here is Ari Emanuel saying that in his own words in 2021. And UFC, uh, we know, has been a tremendous uh, source of just of programming it's been for incredible. someone that was able to make a lot of money with yeah. it. And you it was, split that. It was great on Fox. Right. We're having the best year we've ever had on with ESPN and our partners at Disney and ESPN+. Plus. I think they're doing great, too. So it's been incredible. So it's inarguable that the sudden rise in popularity of the UFC coincided with the twin events of the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ESPN deal. So I think here is a natural place to talk about the ESPN deal and its incentives. The UFC's original business model was built around pay-per-view sales. They were incentivized to make fights that would draw in audiences, build stars, which would make pay-per-view sales more consistent, and grow the audience of paying subscribers. Going forward, I'm going to use pay-per-view sales and pay-per-view buys or just simply buys interchangeably for the same concept. So the ESPN deal completely changed this calculus. ESPN pays the UFC a raw $300 million each year to put on a preset number of events. ESPN absorbs all pay-per-view sales, and the deal reportedly averages out to paying the UFC the equivalent average of 500,000 buys per pay-per-view. Crucially, by creating this structure, the UFC is in my opinion, no longer in the fight promotion business. They are in the business of consistently putting on fights of enough quality to keep MMA fans returning to the ESPN Plus platform. When COVID forced the UFC to shut down shows, this massively threatened the entire revenue model of the company. As such, when the UFC secured a deal with Abu Dhabi to put on fights in the so-called Fight Island, Dana put on three shows in the first seven days of action in Abu Dhabi. Why did he do this? He had to make up for the lack of content during the shutdown to meet his codified obligation to ESPN contractually. If he didn't, hard to say. I don't have access to the contract, but in my opinion, I would assume it's binary. Either they decrement the UFC's yearly payment by a prorated amount, so hypothetically if they are paid for 30 shows at $300 million a year, then they would lose $10 million for each show they miss below 30. Or it could be a complete breach of contract, leading it to being voided. I see this as incredibly unlikely, but it is a possibility nonetheless. The UFC reacted incredibly aggressively to keep the train moving on fights. Nothing untoward there, but it does raise a question in my mind. What's happening with Endeavor in all of this? So to finish this section on the discussion of Endeavor, we need to understand why the UFC has become so incredibly important to them. I hope I pronounced this right, sorry Robert, but Robert Palin, in a piece for MMA on Point in 2021, explained it better than I could. I will utilize a couple key excerpts from his video and cut in with context. First, the regulatory issues with the initial purchase by Endeavor, as well as a financial explanation of a key concept called EBITDA. 
to understand Endeavor's strategy, you must also understand the terms of the acquisition, which explicitly banked on profit growth. Now, if this was the big short, I'd cut to Margot Robbie to explain, but alas, it's not, so let me try. So to complete their purchase, Endeavor needed to borrow $1.8 billion, an amount out of their reach from a regulatory point of view. This all came down to EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. It's basically net income, and it's commonly used to quantify profitability. But crucially, it's also used by financial regulators to prevent excessive borrowing in leveraged buyouts, i.e. using borrowed money to help fund an acquisition like Endeavor did with the UFC. In short, regulators say that a loan to target EBITDA ratio in excess of six times shouldn't really be approved. Therefore, given the 1.8 billion required on the UFC's reported 170 million EBITDA, Endeavor's loan far exceeded the guidelines. So to get around this, lofty projections were used to show a future UFC EBITDA of 300 million, giving them that six times ratio. And this is what got the deal over the line, despite a warning from the Federal Reserve. So Robert gave us a fantastic explanation of some key facts that I want to summarize. First, Robert brings up the issues Endeavor had with taking loans to buy the UFC. The UFC was a little over half as profitable as it needed to be from an EBITDA standpoint for Endeavor to buy a controlling interest. As such, Endeavor had to create a business plan to increase EBITDA growth to make the deal safer from a regulatory standpoint. The specific number Robert mentioned was that the UFC originally had an EBITDA of $170 million annually and that they needed to grow that by a $130 million to a final ending projection of $300 million a year. We of course don't have access to those loan documents to say what their plan was, but with more than six years of context, we can safely say that the strategy was comparable to what they did in reality. So Endeavor needed to find a way to almost double the operating income, i.e. revenue, minus the expenses needed to generate that revenue. Specifically to our examination, we will talk about fighter pay as the primary expense for putting on a UFC event. Assuming that fighter pay had to remain exactly the same, the revenue generated from events had to nearly double to meet the expectations of the FTC. I would posit that the majority of their plan came in the form of selling their media rights to ESPN+, and specifically their parent company Disney, of which Endeavor already had a relationship. This would create a consistent form of revenue for the UFC and would push them over the EBITDA minimum they needed for purchase by Endeavor. Pay-per-view buys are obviously a bit inconsistent based on the hype and talent of a card, so projections of revenue become very hard to do for a company like the UFC. To make a consistent and safe case for EBITDA growth, they would have to sign a deal comparable to the ESPN Plus one, which they obviously did. What Endeavor obviously didn't account for was COVID-19's effects on the world, gambling, and the UFC. So to sell the idea of a leveraged buyout to the FTC, Endeavor projected $300 million in EBITDA. Let's quickly calculate the EBITDA of just the three major sponsorship deals I mentioned, plus the ESPN deal revenue for 2021. I'm going to show the math on screen, but here are the ending values. DraftKings accounts for an increase of $70 million. Crypto.com, $17.5 million. As I said, Stake.com's deal isn't publicly available, but let's estimate a round $13.5 million, which is likely underselling it, but whatever. And finally, $300 million from the ESPN deal. That comes out to a projected EBITDA for 2021 of $400 million. That is an estimated $100 million above the quote, lofty projections that Robert had mentioned them using for the FTC filing. That's also ignoring merchandising sales, event sales, and everything else that is not considered in those three sponsorship deals and the broadcast deals. As such, the UFC was officially a massive cash cow for Endeavor, surpassing even their wildest expectations due to some really fantastic business strategic decision making and leveraging world events. Key to note, none of those deals have a single added value to fighter pay. All of that goes straight to the UFC and by extension Endeavor. Robert later in the video discusses how huge this is for Endeavor, and I didn't even mention the fact that they cut $25 million in payroll expenses in 2016 immediately after their majority purchase. Yeah. And given what we've discussed, it's not surprising that it all points to its revenue being astronomical. Some 95% of Endeavor's own sports segment, 50% of its consolidated EBITDA, and only growing having produced their biggest first half of the year ever in 2021. And now Robert doesn't have the benefit of 2022 hindsight, but halfway through 2021, like he said, more than half of the consolidated EBITDA was just from the UFC. Remember Ari's idea from before? 
He wanted half of his earnings to be management and half to be assets. The UFC alone achieved his goal within five years of Endeavor's purchase. But it's very important to note that all was not sunshine and rainbows. I don't want to get too off track, but it's important to have some context of the environment that Endeavor was in prior to going public through an IPO. A company called WeWork had just attempted to go public, and a series of analyses of that company basically came to the conclusion that it was incredibly overvalued, leading to the overall market for IPOs to nearly crash. Endeavor pulled their IPO attempt during this to avoid losing money, which caused headaches internally for the company. Here's a longish audio clip to understand the first aspect of the pressure Endeavor was under and has remained under since. All right, so let's talk about uh, what happened with the deal. I know that this Hollywood reporter, I don't know whether maybe they are dealing with the guy who used to be in the, look like the old guy from the HBO show, but the dramatic last minute decision to pull the plug on the IPO was not just an embarrassment. It was at least a temporary end to the hope of raising capital to pay down Endeavor's heavy debt, finance further expansion, created a morale problem for some 400 of Endeavor's 7,000 employees who hold shares and have been convinced by the leadership to sit tight. Um, well, that's about as negative as they can. What do, you, what do we say to the Hollywood reporter? Well, here's what I would say to you is, unlo- we got caught in this WeWorks right. growth overhang. We weren't like other people. We didn't have to go public. Um, we were raising five, six hundred million dollars. Right. We have a great, we've had average double digit revenue growth, double digit EBITDA growth. So we're doing well. If you saw recently, we hit our EBITDA numbers that we right. said in the filing. We hit it last year. We did the acquisition of on location, which we'll talk about. Right. Right. We gave a dividend to everybody at the company because we mm-hmm. had the cash flow to do it. We'll reduce, um, we'll delever based on just normal EBITDA growth, right? We're in really good shape. I was not gonna not, I was not gonna hurt my partners that invested in me and backed us by a bad IPO market. That audio clip at the end uses a term called delevering. This refers to paying down debt of which Endeavor has a sizable amount. Endeavor made the UFC purchase with loans, so they have taken on massive amounts of debt to get these returns. It has certainly worked out, but should the UFC's growth falter or shrink due to the rubber band effect of post-quarantine life, Endeavor could hypothetically face difficulties continuing its delevering strategy, threatening its overall growth and returns. So moving on, let's quickly look at present-day EBITDA data for Endeavor. We need to answer the question if it's continuing to grow or not. In the five quarters since Robert's video, Endeavor's EBITDA has remained consistently around $250 million in four out of five quarters, with the fourth quarter of 2021 featuring a nearly 50% drop to $111 million. All told, if we use that same $400 million from the major deals the UFC signed and divide total Endeavor EBITDA of the last four quarters, $869 million by it, we see that those deals represent about 46% of Endeavor's total EBITDA. Essentially, by my math, nearly half of Endeavor's value is tied to just those four deals signed by the UFC, with ESPN Plus and DraftKings representing a vast majority. So, Endeavor needs the UFC to maintain this revenue and grow it to see any noticeable change in their overall business growth. I say this because it is much easier to turn levers on a single business, for example the UFC, rather than the entire remaining aspects and assets of their highly diversified company. As such, this is good and bad for Endeavor. It's highly reliant on the UFC for its profitability, but the UFC purchase has been an unmitigated success for them overall. The most important question for us, though, is a three-parter. How does James Krause affect this? How has the UFC changed post-Endeavor purchase? And how sustainable are those changes? So do you remember the feudal guilds from before? The ESPN deal and the explosion of massive sponsorship deals has radically changed the structure and incentives of the UFC's business model. We need to update that feudal guild picture with Endeavor's purchase of the UFC, their finances, and show how it is affecting the UFC's business model, and by proxy, how it's squeezing the fighters, camps, and managers. So the inclusion of Endeavor, and by proxy the ESPN and DraftKings deals, to the ownership side, is going to tip a lot of balances here. Dana has now essentially displaced the commissions at the top of this feudal structure while retaining the power as guild leader. Commissions still function as a check on UFC power, but overall, the UFC doesn't care much because incentives between the two are essentially aligned now. The UFC has become so powerful that they don't really need Nevada's State Athletic Commission if they try to muscle the UFC. 
They'll go to Arizona, Orlando, or New York. Nevada could still put some pressure on the UFC that would hurt the bottom line, but they are no longer the sport killer they once were. The UFC now has the enforcement capabilities that the feudal lord possessed with the economic power of the guild leaders. Remember how the feudal lord wanted a bale of hay to mediate economic transactions selling horses? That introduced an inherent conflict. If the feudal lord asked for too much, like a 100% tax on all transactions, the guild would skim off the top. They'd sell it for four bales while lying that they sold it for three so that they could keep one bale from the lord. The UFC's elevation and power removed that primitive check on the feudal lord's greed. The UFC is judge, jury, and executioner, as we have now seen with Kraus. But the UFC only has so much time, so they relent and allow the managers to take on certain aspects of the guild's power, but never allow them the power to set prices on the market. That is the key. In my opinion, Managers are becoming less and less useful aside from their ability to reinforce the UFC's feudal guild structure. They are essentially rent-seeking entities at this point, whereas coaches and camps could probably take on a majority of the managerial duties with little change to the fighters day to day. To reduce the length of this already incredibly long video, I'm going to talk specifically about how the fighters were truly affected by the ESPN deal and then understand how that filters up to the managers and their negotiations with the UFC. I'm going to place specific emphasis on the main ways that the UFC is maintaining its profitability with the change calculus of the ESPN deal, and then project a future concern that I expect to become a bigger and bigger deal for the UFC, fighters, and fans' perceptions going forward. So, let's go back to our understanding of how the UFC operated pre-2016 with regard to fighter pay. We need to update our mental model to incorporate the massive changes to the UFC strategy. So one of the key elements of how the UFC recruited and built talent came in the form of their reality TV hit, The Ultimate Fighter. The show produced megastars like Nate Diaz and a plethora of champions and stars for the platform. The Endeavor cuts included budget cuts to the program as stated by Robert again. Not everybody would stick around, however. In a bid to meet their projections, Endeavor had to cut costs, and in October of 2016, just months after the sale, 15% of the UFC staff were laid off. An investor document then confirmed that while cuts would also come elsewhere, including to the Ultimate Fighter's future budget, employee compensation was indeed the biggest area of saving, with the 55.4 million payroll being slashed by half. This ultimately meant pink slips for the likes of Global Brand Officer Gary Cook, Chief Con Content Officer Marshall Zelaznik and UFC Canada Chief Tom Wright who was laid off along with 80% of his staff. Other important players would leave too including legendary matchmaker Joe Silva who retired, Brazil Chief Giovanni Decker and Dave Schaller, notable defensive lineman and VP of Public Relations who took a job with the Philadelphia 76ers. Wrong sport Dave. Wrong sport. The most publicised layoffs though were that of UFC legends Matt Hughes and Chuck Liddell who under Zufa were given jobs to retire. While many including Chael Sonnen believed their roles to be largely ceremonial, a lot of fans were outraged. Dana for his part lamented that while they were his guys, these sorts of cuts were unfortunately normal in a takeover and as cold as that might sound, it's true particularly here given their massive debt. So how could the UFC replace this talent acquisition cheaply? Dana White's Contender Series, in which a number of regional talents as well as some major talents like Bo Nickel compete in a typical three-round cage fight with Dana personally deciding who does and doesn't get a contract. No problem there. He highly prioritizes finishes and the winners of fights in his signings, but a key missing piece is the humanizing element the Ultimate Fighter incorporated in their usage of the reality TV format, making fighters come off as fully rounded humans. Now it's become a just sort of win in your in system. Again, not really an issue, but it's a great lead in to the main tactic that Dana and Endeavor have used to solve the pressure they have to put on consistent shows. The ESPN deal dictates more shows, more shows means a greater need for fighters to fill those cards. One could say that Dana's guild economy has to industrialize. What Dana did, which is brilliant in its industrial efficiency, is to create a system that I'm going to coin the industrial 10 and 10 pathway. 10 and 10 refers to the theoretical minimum contract the UFC offers, meaning 10,000 to win and 10,000 to show. However, the minimum is disputed as Krauss says here. You know what I mean? I make 10% of a guy that majority of, I mean, if we're not talking about Brandon Moreno, like right. most of my guys are entry level guys making 
12, 12, 14, 14. You know, I have some guys making in the 20s, but. But 10 and 10 has a better ring to it, and that's my term, so I make the rules. Also, Jack Della Maddalena says here that he was 10 and 10 when he came into the UFC. The, to be honest, the, the first contracts in the UFC are pretty, they're not great. As everyone knows. 12, is it 12 and 12? They start at 10 and 10, and then they, they work up from there. There are many ways the UFC's hierarchy broke and stunted itself into this industrialized guild form rather than the market employed by, say, the NBA. To me, the industrialization of 10 and 10 fighters is the key component that stunted the UFC's market. Think of it like this. If you get paid a fixed amount per card by ESPN, it is not in your best business interest to pack the card with high show, high win contract fighters, right? That only matters if you make a non-fixed rate i.e. a variable revenue rather than fixed revenue. What I mean is that if a fighter's contract is tied to their drawing power, but the amount of eyeballs you draw doesn't matter as much anymore, why have them fight? The key business understanding here is that before ESPN, UFC made money variably on pay-per-view sales. This incentivized them to put big names on pay-per-views to push buys. Now they get a fixed payment per pay-per-view so anyone with basic financial understanding would recommend limiting the cost to put on said pay-per-view to increase per-event profitability. Recommendations like fighting as much as possible in a facility where you control the production and property to most easily put out consistent productions. But also, another logical recommendation would be to find ways to artificially limit the labor costs of cars to save as much money as possible. It is really key to understand that the economics have shifted radically due to the change from variable to fixed revenue, creating the preconditions for the 10 and 10 industrialization. It makes perfect business sense, but it has a knock-on effect of drastically limiting fighters' earning potential. Since the UFC is by far the biggest game in town, they are the best ways to make money. Here's where we get into the fun legal parts. The UFC theoretically knows this, and like famous monopolists Andrew Carnegie and Cornelius Vanderbilt before them, the UFC is theoretically leveraging that to great economic benefit. Not theoretically, the UFC is involved currently in a federal antitrust lawsuit in the United States, meaning that the federal government is currently deciding if the UFC is a monopoly, and if so, how to deal with it. Irrespective of the U.S. government's action or inaction, I think that there is a more pressing concern that the UFC is overlooking in their ever-increasing quest to reduce variable costs on a per-card basis. Healthcare costs. So now, we return to TJ Dillashaw and fighter healthcare. MMA is inherently an incredibly dangerous sport. As such, there is what is called a selection bias inherent to the professional talent. I will let TJ explain it to you in his own words. Everything that I kind of had to bury down deep and never talk about, you know, just like not even to myself, even when I had those sleepless nights, I'm just thinking about all the just kind of like do what you can to forget about it and believe in yourself. Cause that's what we're bred to do. You're bred to have mental toughness for this sport and throughout wrestling or whatever it may be. And, uh, and now I'm getting for, for being too mentally tough, I guess, you know? Now this is a flawed, but somehow noble belief set he and others like him hold. Going all the way back to Dana Stanford's speech on incentives, this is to me the inherent flaw with his argument as I brought up earlier with the LeBron James example. He doesn't understand the mentality of his fighters. TJ has the MMA equivalent of Bushido Code, altering his mental incentive structure. Just like the horse trader who cared more about losing out on his two bales of hay rather than the fact that a surf got ripped off by more than 100% of the horse's value, Dana is operating under false assumptions. In my opinion, the industrialization of 10 and 10 fighters combined with either his realization of the prior fact or even a roundabout recognition of the financial disincentive TJ metaphorically represents will likely dawn on Dana, creating what I consider to be the second shoe to drop, causing the UFC huge labor issues. Healthcare. Okay, so here's the thing. While researching this video, I realized why the UFC treated Anderson Silva, Frankie Edgar, and other past their prime legends so callously. But first, we have to talk about Jorge Masvidal. So Jorge Masvidal was an MMA journeyman before he exploded onto the general consciousness of the casual fan on the back of a hellacious flying knee knockout and celebration over his opponent, Ben Askren. Jorge, like a true prizefighter, cashed in heavy on this newfound fame. 
TKOing Nate Diaz by injury to win the inaugural UFC baddest motherfucker in the UFC belt. But one problem. Masvidal's talent as a striker was apparent, but he never progressed in the grappling dimension past a barely average wrestler. As such, he reeled off loss after loss to talented wrestlers like Usman and Covington to the point of losing basically all of his momentum. But let's think of him more as a concept than a person. Masvidal's ascent is statistically improbable, but obviously can occur. The UFC used to be in the business of making Masvidal's, but I would contend they no longer are. Think of it this way. Let's pretend that one out of every 100 fights, a Masvidal-like breakthrough happens. A promotion keen on building more and more stars would focus on turning that 1 out of 100 probability higher to say 5 out of 100, or even higher. But the reverse logic is also true. Instead of trying to make 5 stars in 100 fights, I could instead put on 500 fights and get the same number of stars by pure probability. That latter choice is also technically a lot less work for the UFC. In my opinion, this is how the UFC operates now. When the Masvidals break through, managers cash in on sponsorships and product developments like Connor's Whiskey, Chandler's Fitness App, Poirier's Hot Sauce, Patty Pimblett and Molly McCann with Barstool, and Masvidal's Tequila. Now when Masvidal's begin to fall off talent-wise after negotiating higher show and win purses due to increased pay-per-view pull market value, they get entered into the high show, high win industrial disposal pathway, or as I have come to call it, the MMA glue factory. If you don't know the reference of what a glue factory is, I don't think I would recommend you Google it, but just understand that what I'm trying to say is that older fighters are getting disposed of, and we'll just leave it at that. So the UFC will put high contract old fighters versus young cheap talent for three reasons. One, tank their market value so they can't cash in with other promotions when their contract is up. Keep them from cashing in on their win bonuses on the way out. And finally, to put over young talent. I want to spend a little bit of time on that second one before we move on. So to truly understand that second point, I will provide hypothetical examples. Let's pretend Frankie was getting paid $200,000 to show and $200,000 to win. If he wins his fight, that is the equivalent of 40 10 and 10 fighter show payments. That's a lot of money that he represents. But if the UFC puts him in a no-win situation, they can assure themselves he only hits for $200,000. That halves the hit to the event's profitability that Edgar represents in risk. That's the key to understanding this overall point. So furthermore, there is also a developing trend for high fame, low MMA skill potential fighters that hasn't happened enough for me to dive too deep, but I'm going to call it the Molly McCann B-side plan so far. Instead of older, high contract fighters being eliminated to keep per card variable fighter pay low, the UFC may go the route they went with Molly, which is when fighters who talent-wise don't stack up to their fan base's expectations they will put said fighter nearing their new contract against an incredible up-and-coming prospect like, say, Aaron Blanchfield, who goes on to completely decimate Molly. This tanks her contract value before the next extension, puts over Aaron Blanchfield in front of the hometown crowd, and keeps the gravy train rolling for the UFC. But again, why? Now, the UFC doesn't put contract details out publicly like the NBA does, so everything I said with respect to Molly is speculation, so allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. But this seems like a really logical stance for them to take, viewed through the lens of their new business model that I have outlined. Because the variable cost of fighters' contracts has substantially larger effects on the UFC's EBITDA compared to the revenue they generate from t-shirt sales promoting Masvidal, Molly, and others. Also, that introduces labor issues. If the UFC makes tons of money on merchandising, a fighter like Masvidal or Molly McCann, they will inevitably have to offer that to fighters since they are monetizing their names. Going this route protects the system from further labor disputes and negotiations. I would posit that any weird decision the UFC has made with matchmaking can be viewed through the lens of protecting the industrialized system and suppressing marginal fighter pay costs per card and it'll make substantially more sense than the prevailing take on why Molly fought Aaron. But back to health insurance. Okay, so like I said, I see the most important second shoe to drop coming in the form of fighter health insurance payments. So really think on the overall business concept I'm trying to drill in here. 
If the UFC is trying to suppress per card variable costs in the form of fighter purses, it is not a far stretch to think that the follow-up cost savings will come in this form. As such, I see fighter health insurance and surgeries as the next serious financial obstacle for the UFC to overcome. As I said before, all reporting points to the fact that the UFC contractually only has to cover surgeries that occur during fights they put on. Technically, they don't have to pay for the shoulder surgery TJ has because he freely admits to not having it happen during the fight. But they will still pay because he is a star that drives pay-per-views. But what about the 10 and 10 fighters that are chewed up and spit out efficiently in the business of volume star making? I do not think it's an incredible stretch to start hearing stories of how fighters are going to start getting checked at the UFC PI before fights as a safety precaution. I expect the follow-up being that those same 10 and 10 fighters get left with the bill on injuries they incurred outside of the cage to suppress variable insurance costs per card. Or even less aggressively, the UFC may just dramatically reduce how often they let certain fighters like say Yaya Rodriguez, Dillashaw, and Kamara Usman compete in the promotion due to their consistent injury issues that will likely only get worse and worse as time progresses. This will likely come in the form of reduced fight volume for these fighters, less impactful fights, i.e. fewer high-ranking fights, title shots, and interim title opportunities. The key example, in my opinion, is a fighter like Arnold Allen being passed over for the interim featherweight shot. There are tons of reasons it could have happened, but Arnold also has a consistent history of injuring his hands and needing surgery on them. So does Yair Rodriguez with his feet, but he is a larger draw at this stage and from a market, Mexico, that the UFC is trying to build right now. This is where I see the future potential issues will come from and lead to the key issue that relates to Kraus, which is fighters not being greedy, but increasingly financially desperate. Here are some clips of what I mean. I make more money gambling on MMA than I do anything else. Come on, more than even coaching? Oh God, that'll make you coaching. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it's absolutely not. Like, I mean, I mean, if you're talking about time, yeah, no, like if I go out, on, if I go out on a Wednesday, that's true. I go out on a Wednesday to Sunday, that's the most, you know what I mean? I make ten percent of a guy that majority. Of, I mean, if we're not talking about Brandon Moreno, like right. most of my guys are entry level guys making twelve, twelve, fourteen, fourteen. You know, I have some guys making in the twenties, but even even at that, like you get ten percent of twenty grand is. Two thousand dollars. I'm on the road every weekend, right. Wednesday to Sunday. You know what I mean? Like it, it just doesn't. No, to answer your question, no, <laughs> it's not even close. It's not even close. And now here's TJ. Then after I lost the Hudo, I got double shoulder surgery. I didn't just get double shoulder surgery because I wanted to. I got it because I needed to. But something I'd been putting off because I had big title fight after big title fight. Look, man, I'm the, I believe I'm the best in the world. So. I want to get my belt back. I want to do these things before I go and get my body fixed. Because you get your shoulder fixed, you're out for a year, and you're never guaranteed to be back. I mean, let's look at my left shoulder again, you know? So I have spent way too long explaining all of this. So you can understand the totality of why James Krause and the situation surrounding him is becoming a massive problem for the UFC. I'm going to conclude basically every piece of evidence into a simple concept. The UFC is no longer in the fight promotion business, the UFC is the Netflix of MMA. Netflix built itself into an absolute behemoth on the back of venture capital dollars sinking ever larger amounts of money into any and every production in Hollywood they could. Their business model became a pipeline for investor dollars to fund lesser quality movies and industrialize their development and release. Netflix knew it needed to keep putting out content in order to keep people subscribed to their streaming service. So they kept spending and spending and spending until the bubble finally burst. Like the UFC, Netflix surged majorly on the back of COVID. People are at home. One would expect they'll be watching more TV, right? February 28th, 2020. Netflix was valued at $369.06 per share. October 29th, 2021, it had nearly doubled to $690.31 per share. A mere three months later, on January 28th, 2022, the price had dropped to $384.36 per share. In three months, all of those gains were nearly completely wiped out. A lot has happened, of course, but what economists call a bubble popped. Netflix was spending hand over fist to keep the new content pumping out to retain and grow their subscriber base at increasing rates. 
this propelled the stock forward higher and higher until subscriber growth dropped precipitously due to world conflict events and inflation. The ride was over. Netflix sits as of today's writing on December 2nd, 2022 at $316.39 per share. Netflix is now less valuable than it was before the COVID boom. COVID shut down every major sport, but the UFC kept trucking. They cashed in to the tune of a 300% plus increase in EBITDA and Ari Emanuel looking like an absolute genius. But like inflation and world conflict events, James Krause has lit a fire that the UFC will likely be unable to put out. They have never developed the business muscle to handle problems with intelligent PR tactics. Instead, they operate with their omerta-like code of silence, which inevitably led to the compounding of their issues. They should have punished Krause immediately after the interview with Ariel, but they didn't. They waited, because that's what they do. On December 2, 2022, they banned him for life and every fighter under him was banned until they moved gyms. The UFC overreacted because it responded too slowly. All of this without any public evidence of truly fixed fights. Only the perception based on all available evidence as it currently stands. Now Kraus is not without fault. What he did was incredibly wrong and unethical and he should be punished for that. But this isn't about him. The UFC punished him so hard so that they can make the public believe that the gambling markets are safe and secure. They don't seem to have done their due diligence on making sure that this is not a repeatable offense. Their focus is not on the integrity of the sport, they care about the profits of DraftKings and the $70 million a year that pours into their coffers from their deal. Destroying James Krause's life doesn't solve their problem. That's why I talked about TJ Dillashaw. TJ represents to me why this will continue to happen. MMA is a naturally dangerous sport. Those that compete accept that risk and as such we have a sport. But gamblers don't seem to understand the inherent danger and risk so they gamble without fully understanding the sport. If they stopped, DraftKings loses money and the UFC loses their deal. Kraus is one man who ignited the biggest story in MMA since 2016. But the true issue is the competition between the needs and wants of their two major sponsors, ESPN and DraftKings. DraftKings wants fights that appear to have integrity to the average better. ESPN wants content to shove into our faces so we can continue paying for ESPN Plus to satiate their financial bottom line. DraftKings wouldn't want TJ to fight injured the way he was because gamblers will feel cheated. ESPN doesn't want the co-main event to fall apart, especially when one of the most bankable stars on the card is the one falling out due to injury. Therein lies the problem. The UFC has to decide what it is. Are you an MMA promotion business with all the injuries and warts that come with it? Or are you a company that sells picks and plays on fights while pretending that fighters come in at their peak of their abilities? I doubt the UFC makes a choice, and as such they fall into a death spiral of poorly thought out rules and regulations that will only serve one of their two masters, but always at the expense of the fighters and coaches. The labor side of the equation will always be the losers in all of this. It is short-sighted to blame Krauss for all of these issues. They created a system of fighter pay with dubious ethical splits, which is bad enough, but worse. They constructed it without thought for precedent and didn't change it when their business tripled over five years, further expounding their greedy errors. As such, they have been running up a massive metaphorical bill in the form of pushback from fighters, coaches, and worst of all for the UFC, their real bosses, Endeavor, ESPN, and DraftKings. And guess what? The bill is coming due. I highly doubt they will like the bottom line.